radio, television, journalism, marketing, advertising, public relations, broadcast program syndication, public speaking, and consulting. And also dishwashing. And dishwashing. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a badge of merit for that one. Uh, during his time as a, as a TV news director and anchor, and following, uh, and following that, he interviewed, consulted, and or interacted with presidents Harry Truman, John Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, uh, and to a lesser extent, Ford, Carter, and Clinton. He also served as a senior advisor to U.S. Senator John McCain, traveling with the Senator's 2008 campaign for president. He was also a communications consultant to Texas Governor Ann Richards and New York Governor Mario Cuomo. Neil Stultz created, produced, and syndicated an American moment with both Charles Corral and also an American moment with James Earl Jones. The internationally acclaimed TV news programs that were featured in over 100 U.S. markets. And for 40 years, he was editor-publisher of the weekly Neil Stelz Austin Letter, Letter Journalistic Report. He received the nation's top award for radio news reporting from the National Society of Professional Journalists and the National Headliners Club. Uh, their highest award for consistently outstanding television news coverage in the United States. Over the years, he's been cited for his bravery and for saving countless lives while reporting under fire and in real time the then unimaginable horrors of history's first mass school shooting from atop the tower at the University of Texas campus in Austin. The holder of three communication degrees from the University of Texas and only that one that's not from UT. Uh, he was named, I said it too, I'm sorry, I forgot about that first undergraduate degree. Uh, he was named Outstanding Alumnus of UT's College of Communication and was honored when the college permanently named the Neil Stelz Broadcast Journalism Studio in his honor. He was named the Austin's most worthy, most worthy citizen for his civic and charitable work. In other business pursuits, he received the nation's highest award for public relations was accorded a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Austin Advertising Federation, and received a Lifetime Trailblazer Award from the American Women in Radio and Television. Now also with him tonight is his daughter, Seal. Now, nearly half of Seal's storytelling career was devoted to journalism, working in Waco, New Orleans, Dallas, and ultimately coming back to her hometown in Austin. In Austin, she proudly co-anchored the evening news with her father, Neil, as the nation's only father-daughter evening news, the, the anchor team, and then the, also the only father-daughter political correspondence team. After retiring from TV news, she and her husband co-founded the boutique brand, film and television firm, Electrofish, and together they created and executive produced the nationally acclaimed documentary television series, Friday Night Tights, which aired for six successful seasons and was nominated for a sports Emmy. Seal's a multiple Emmy Award winner and also a multiple nominee. Now, originally we had just asked Neil to do the lecture, but it was Neil's suggestion and one that I love uh, as to have more of a conversation. And given the crowd tonight, I think this is really appropriate. So we're excited to present the little scene side of LBJ, a conversation with Seal, Spouse, Ellie, and Neil Spouse. And also, they're going to feature some of the photos from, his, from Neil's memoir with the bark off a journalist memories of LBJ and a life in the news media. And we have two autographed copies available by a silent auction outside. So bid often, proceeds go to help the museum. So I am excited to be able to present this program for y'all this evening. I know you're going to enjoy it. I really look forward to hearing it. And the stage is Thank you, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> Reporting live from the other end of the table. <laughs> well, You're on. <laughs> <laughs> is this live? <laughs> so, you know, it is kind of fun because it is as though Dad and I get to reprise uh, one of the most special times I know in my career, and which mine. was getting to spend oh, yeah. several years uh, at the news desk with Dad. And uh, talk about knowing somebody who has your back 
all the time. You know, there's nothing like working right along the side. Uh, my greatest champion and my biggest fan, and likewise. So well, this is and, really and, special. And you, you don't know how much you learn until you sit beside your daughter and she teaches you <laughs> so much <laughs> <laughs> about everything. <laughs> I don't know about that. I do know that one time, though, I accidentally, we were covering the Democratic National Convention, and Dad, you were, I was pitching to you somewhere, and I, I said, back to you, Bill, instead of, <laughs> as in Bill Clinton, I guess. <laughs> so I've just been reporting on him. You handled it so well. Well, thank you. Uh, this is Neil Spells. <laughs> reporting back to you, Seal. <laughs> but, no, we, re we really enjoy having this opportunity. And the, the special part about this, I think that you all will find so intriguing, which is something that has been such a special part of you know, my life and my family's life for so long, is getting to hear these stories. These stories, it's not about about politics, it's about politicians, and it's about just this really fascinating experience that Dad's been, I mean, you were exposed to so much over from the very beginning of his career. It's as though you were just plucked into these major it, events. It, yeah, it was right after Columbus discovered America. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought there were dinosaurs involved, no? <laughs> so it's, um, and the, the whole book is, is just this peeled back look. At, at these experiences, these um, conversations that you overheard and that you also got to participate in. And uh, I, I was thinking, just as Wayne was talking uh, a few minutes ago, that it's almost like you guys are getting a sneak peek into what the audiobook is like, because Dad narrates the audiobook, and um, you have your little bookmarks here, and you can learn a little bit more about that as well. But to hear you, I, I just recently listened to the whole thing again, hmm. and it just, an, yeah, I'm probably a little biased, <laughs> I'll admit. But there, it, it's just so compelling to hear you telling these stories again, and then having audio clips from all of these moments in history and moments in time intermixed with your storytelling. Um, it was very powerful. So well, I just well, wanted we've you got, to We've got a lot of sound of LBJ mm -hmm. uh, in here. At that, in fact, some that are not referred to in the book itself, uh, got LBJ telling jokes. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, he, he was like Abraham Lincoln. He didn't have a one-liner like Ronald Reagan. No, no, he told stories. And we have those stories, LBJ telling stories on himself and, uh, and to make a point. And uh, we have those captured in the audio book. Uh, courtesy of the LBJ Library in Austin, where they've been on repository there for, for well, ever since he left office. Well, <laughs> why don't we start? I, I think one of the biggest questions that most people have is, if they're not LBJ aficionados, like most of you probably are and understand the title of the book, but uh, With the Bark Off is a title that uh, I think raises questions and interest, mm -hmm. and it's got a fascinating uh, uh, story well, behind it. well, you know, interestingly, uh, one of the, the uh, interesting parts of my career with LBJ was after he uh, left office and came back here, his primary project was to build the LBJ library and set up the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Well, as it turned out, he asked me to, uh, and, and paid me to do this, uh, to be the chair of the opening of the LBJ Library and its dedication. It was a six-month job. We built a huge staff uh, to make all that happen. It was one of the largest, and maybe still is, one of the largest uh, events of its type ever in Austin's history. More than 1,000 people showed up. They were all VIPs. Uh, uh, and we had two hotels <laughs> in Austin at that time. You had the Driscoll. And the Commodore, uh, well, not even the Commodore Perry at that point, it was Stephen F. Austin. Uh, we took over a floor of the old abandoned Commodore Perry Hotel to build a staff in order to stage the dedication. It, it was huge. Ha where do you put those people? <laughs> well, we found out because the University of Texas semester had just ended, and we went in and commandeered a women's dormitory that had a uh, room here, a uh, room here, and then a uh, uh, shared bath. And so there was like a two-bedroom suite. And we converted that to be run by all volunteers. We got the university artwork from its archives and put it on the walls there. We had uh, set up entertainment in the lobby 
And when the VIP would be brought up, we had uh, volunteers. Land Commissioner Bob Armstrong was the doorman, would open the door, let, bring them in. We had popcorn going in the lobby and uh, created an atmosphere there that, well, first of all, looked like a crisis. Where the hell are you going to put all those people, Neil? <laughs> They're all going to expect, you know, VIP treatment. Well, we gave it to them by making this event happen in that regard. Well, at that event, and I'll go into it in just a few moments. We could actually pop that slide up now, Dad, if you want to, because it's, I think oh, it's a good okay. flow, yeah. Uh, about the, uh, with the bark off? Yeah, with what? the bark off, and you're talking about it was right here okay. at the uh, actual. Yeah. Now, I want you to take a look at this. Now, this, this, this is one of the most significant events that's ever occurred in this area. Look at that platform that was uh, for the dedication. This is where LBJ made his speech, where he said, talking about the archives, everything that he had in the library, he said, it's all here, the story of our time with the bark off. He says, I do not know how this period will be regarded in years to come, but that's not the point. This library will show the facts, not just the joys and the triumphs, but the sorrow and failures too with the bark off. So we picked that title. And let me tell you. Go right back uh, to it. Oh, you go back to that. Yep. The picture of the dedication. Look at the numbers. You have in an open platform at the height of Vietnam War demonstrations and protests, you have in an open platform on the University of Texas campus, these people in five people that are, in, uh, actually four of the five people that are in line to succeed to the presidency if something happened to the president. Now think about that. You have these demonstrations, you have Christ, you have all this going on at this time. And you've got number one is Spiro Agnew, the vice president, his, uh, right there behind LBJ's head. Number two, you can barely see, <laughs> he was a little short guy, <laughs> Carl Albert was the Speaker of the House. Next in line, that if something happened to the President and the Vice President, Carl Albert would be the President. And then after that was the President Pro Tem, who did not attend, uh, again, because someone had to stay in Washington. I mean, that's, that's the law, the rule. But number four in line of succession is Secretary of State William Rogers. And beside Secretary of State William Rogers, number five, is Secretary of the Treasury, John Connolly. So if any of those people, if he, President Nixon, had died in, or couldn't hold office, all those people who would follow him and become President of the United States were sitting out there in an open platform and right under the stadium, this is right across from the stadium at uh, UT, I can't tell you the security. We didn't announce it at the time. We had National Guard troops hidden under the stadium, just in case. The whole area was cordoned off so that we, protesters couldn't get close. And thank goodness we didn't have drones. We didn't have the things like that occur today. I don't think you could replicate this scene today in these sorts of circumstances. And you had, in addition to that, under, the law school was right across the way. ATF and Secret Service forces were stationed there just in case, just in case something happened. Obviously, nothing happened <laughs> except uh, one, pro one problem. Ed, you had a question? Okay. Uh, I, I screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> all this, I mean, we planned. I mean, six months of planning all the resources that we ever needed the university provided. I mean, it... You know, if you need it, you, let's do it. If you need, oh, well, I like the, uh, the dormitory for women. If you need it, let's do it. So here we go. We finish this. LBJ makes his uh, speech and uh, uh, with the bark off. And uh, the Longhorn Band back in the corner, uh, uh, everybody starts clapping. The Longhorn Band, the eyes of Texas, et cetera. And LBJ and, uh, and Nixon start walking up the outdoor stairs, going up to the plaza of the LBJ Library, where these thousand people in chairs down on the lawn around this magnificent fountain 
he'd tur they'd turn and wave back to the crowd. Oh, you know, what a dramatic moment. I mean, that's going so good. Well, the fountain had not been turned on, and our little plan was that when they get to the top, start waving, till Gabriel blows his horn, <laughs> and then, boom, the fountain goes up, <laughs> just like that. Wow, what a moment. We didn't count on the wind. <laughs> the fountain sprayed all the people out <laughs> in the crowd. I mean, literally. It just now it was a mist. It, it you know it wasn't like a shower, but they, and of course they're all dressed in their finery. They're they're coming to a, a, a big 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 time event, and but thank goodness it turned out. Thank goodness it turned out to be okay because of the mood was good, you know, oh yeah, okay, we got a little wet, that's all right. Now, oh, I got to tell this one. Yeah, okay, go okay. ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, the chairman of the Board of Regents of the University of Texas was a fellow by the name of Frank Irwin, mm -hmm. all-powerful. Frank Irwin was responsible for the library being on the university campus and was responsible for the University of Texas paying the cost to build the LBJ Library on university land. Now, that, that every other presidential library you take a look at now has been paid for by private money that has been raised. So this is very rare for the university to do this. And Frank Irwin made it happen, he called him Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, I answered to two people, uh, LBJ and Chairman Irwin. I mean, he, he, that, that was his building, in effect. It, 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 he made it happen. It would not have happened without him. Frank Irwin was not an amateur drinker. <laughs> he, uh, so when he, we were planning the event, he said, Now, Neil, when the ceremony ends and we get ready to serve barbecue lunch up there on the plaza, everybody, everybody's going to want to drink. And I said, oh, Mr. Chairman, no, we can't do that. I said, the University of Texas has a rule. There is no, at this time now, there is no uh, alcohol to be served on the University of Texas campus. You, you couldn't buy a drink on the campus. And you couldn't buy mixed drinks anywhere hardly except in private clubs like the 40 Acres Club or nearby. And I said, man, we can't do that. He said, why is that? I said, well, it's illegal. He said, I know. <laughs> and I said, but think of the publicity. My goodness, what happens if we get busted, have this great ceremony and, and LBJ and everybody's tarred with this, uh, this uh, arrest or this uh, brouhaha of some kind? He said, hmm, okay. I, and then I went on. I said, you just got to realize, Mr. Chairman, that sometimes we have to bend and not do the things that we really want to do. He said, hmm, okay. Okay, I understand. I understand. I, I thought, hey, I've, I've won the war. It was just the battle, not the war. <laughs> as soon as that fountain sprayed everybody, I can't tell you how many different mobile bars <laughs> were rolled out from doorways, hidden under areas, coming out from the LBJ School of Public Affairs, coming out from the library itself. Stacked, I mean, whiskey. Premium whiskey, let me tell you, all across the top, and dressed bartenders dressed to the nines, and they were pouring whiskey. <laughs> did your heart just drop? <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what I did. I walked over to Chairman Irwin, and uh, I, you know I was just I, I, I didn't know what to do. I thought, and I walked over, and he was sipping his scotch. He says, <laughs> just just looked at me, grinned, <laughs> and wink, and. And I didn't say it out loud. I don't think he heard me, but I muttered, Are you some bitch? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then and he, he just sat there. I don't know to this day if he paid for it personally or if he found a way to hide the cost of all of that in the university budget somewhere. I wouldn't be surprised either way that what happened. But uh, that helped, I, I have to admit, uh, you know, people had a drink and they had a great uh, music. It was a wonderful experience. 
but uh, we could have we could have gotten busted. Mm -hmm. And not with uh, Frank Irwin and his money behind it, huh? Well, probably not. <laughs> <Tell you. laughs> and everyone soon forgot they got sprayed <laughs> by the fountain. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> anyway, I got I got way off on a tangent here in that regard. But uh, uh, LBJ, at that time, uh, when I say I answered to him, I have to tell you a few other little stories about this that are in the book. Uh, he was devoted to spending as much of his time as possible looking at every little detail of the design and the uh, exhibits and what went into the library and how it was all. It, it, when you walk into the LBJ library, you're walking into a place that every little aspect of it was approved by and guided by Lyndon Johnson. Now here's a, a leader of the free world who is sitting there making these daily decisions and looking at it. So it was, a, it was a pretty tense time because the date was set May 22nd to open. The date was set because that was right after classes stopped at the university and the campus theoretically would be cleared and we knew that there would be protests and we'd made all those plans. And uh, at one point, I, uh, I, I did something. I'm not sure what I did. LBJ grabbed me, and you've seen the pictures. Grabbed me by the lapel, and, and, and let me tell you, he's you know six four, big tall guy, and I'm six feet, 135 pounds. <laughs> you know, not not a heavyweight by any means. And he down at me, and he chewed my butt out like you wouldn't believe. And he used every cuss word he could think of and just hammered on me. And uh, I took it. You know, I didn't, I, I don't remember what it was about, but I'm not a combative guy uh, or argumentative type guy. Uh, so I just said, yes, sir, Mr. President. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. And he kept on. I mean, it wasn't one of those, you sorry about it. You did, you shouldn't have done it. No, no. It wasn't you shouldn't have done it. It's you did this and you really screwed it, you know, et cetera. So the, the next day, I needed a decision from the president. I can't tell you. I don't, know, I don't know if you know how deflated and you would feel after LBJ got in your face and really berated you. I mean, really, really. I called him the master of butt chewings, and I got the lead load <laughs> of, of LBJ. So the next day, I needed a decision I, from him. He was out at the ranch, and uh, I picked up the phone and called the ranch. The ranch switchboard patched me through to the Lincoln, where he and his Secret Service agent that was with him all the time. Mike Howard was with him. The two of them were out on the ranch. Well, a uh, phone rang and Mike answered it. I said, Mike, it's Neil. <laughs> How are you doing today, Neil? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, he was standing right there beside LBJ, as he always did uh, when I got, I got my butt chewed. And uh, I said, well, I need to speak to the man. Are you sure you want to speak to me? <laughs> I said, Mike, I've got to. And I need a decision from him. He said, well, he's out checking his cattle. And uh, he's not right here in the car. He said, and Mike said, but I can go get him if you want me to. I said, well, I, we got to. He came back later, got on the phone, Mike Howard, and says, Neil, you're not going to believe this. I've been fired. I thought, that's it. That's it. It's all over. I might as well pack up. And he said, you're just not going to believe this. I said, well, what? He said, the man told me to tell you that he trusted you, he believed in you, and would do whatever you wanted. He thought your judgment was good and would follow through on it. He didn't need to know what it was about. I don't even know what it is. You tell Neil to go ahead and do what he thinks is right. <laughs> oh! Now, the word mercurial 
in the, <laughs> in the dictionary has LBJ right out beside <laughs> it. Can you imagine going from way down here, mentally, physically, you know, up here floating on a cloud? He had this way about him, and uh, people have written other things about it, about how he, he would do things to denigrate, to, uh, to put you down, make his point, but he didn't convey, I don't think, I never saw him carry uh, a, a grudge or hatred except for just one or two people that, that I knew about. Uh, you know, there were probably a lot more. You know, Bobby Kennedy was one of them. He never, never liked Bobby Kennedy. But there was a time that uh, I, I saw in him um, uh, the, what, I, what we call today the little scene side, saw the two extremes of his personality and his loyalty. And when you think about that, uh, and I have thought about it, believe me, there's a factor there of loyalty. He was loyal to me, because I was loyal to him in that regard. He placed this, th this level of, of, uh, of appreciation to loyalty. I mean, he, he, he demanded loyalty, and he gave loyalty. Even though he would chew your butt out, he gave loyalty in that sense. So it, that was demonstrated in a lot of different ways, I'm sure, throughout his presidency, and even after that, like, like this was. But it was a mark of that man who had made such an impact. And you saw some of that, those of you who watched the CNN two-part, four-part on two nights series that just ran this past Sunday and Monday. But anyway, that experience at the, uh, you didn't stop me, you know. It's so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I hear it, it's as though I'm hearing it for the first time. But you know, what I was thinking that struck me was, we started in the early 70s with these stories just now, but your journey, you talk about that loyalty, you really earned into that loyalty because you ended up with the LBJ family at, at the KTBC mid-50s, late 50s? I started at uh, KTBC TV in Austin, it was Channel 7, uh, in 1956. Uh, I replaced Bill Moyers, uh, who was a uh, part-time university student reporter working in the news department. I, I had never met LBJ. I saw LBJ. I was 12 years old, uh, barefooted, running to a softball field in Raymondville, Texas, because this helicopter was flying around and the loudspeaker saying, this is Lyndon Johnson. I'm running for the U.S. Senate, and I want to come out and talk to you. Come follow me out here at this to the softball field. Well, I walk out there, go running, my brother and I, wow, a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> right, it didn't matter that it was LBJ. <laughs> yeah. and, and my impression of LBJ was, he's the guy with the helicopter, mm -hmm. that, that's all it was. So fast forward then to 1956, that was 1948, to 1956, uh, when it started working at the TV station. Of course, I knew that the Johnson family owned the TV station, I knew that. Uh, everybody knew that uh, because uh, the TV station was uh, cussed a lot because it was the only station in town, and you couldn't, ha you didn't have a choice at that er those early days of television. And the first time we met mm -hmm. at KTBC, I was introduced to him by Paul Bolton, who was who had hired me, uh, and uh, I said, Neil, you know, this is uh, this is Senator Johnson. He was Senate Majority Leader at the time. And I said, uh, uh, I, you know, I was flustered, my goodness. This is the majority leader of the United States Senate, and I'm a 20-year-old kid here. And, uh, you, you know, put yourself in that position. Uh, you just, so, I, you know, I mumbled, yes, sir, Senator, nice to meet you, you know, something like that. But I remember what he said. He said, Neil, Whenever you take a picture of me, shoot this side of my face. It's my best side. <laughs> <laughs> and if, you, if you'll notice, most of LBJ's pictures, the paid campaign photos and all, kind of show him from this side. And uh, Maybe his left side? His left side. Right there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With an adoring Neil Spells right in the middle. <laughs> 
knowing exactly what who your boss is oh, on that well, one. Well, <laughs> in, in fact, that's that's what the staff said when they saw that picture was taken at High Andersport right after they got the nomination for president and vice president. They said, "Here I am, my goodness, John F. Kennedy. Oh wow, again, like here, yeah, they, you know, my goodness, 1960, John F. Kennedy. Wow." But look who I'm looking at. <laughs> <laughs> they said, you know who your boss was, Neil. <laughs> That's right. And then you'll notice that the uh, book cover has been cropped. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that, that was yeah. a quote, a book about LBJ. But I thought, no, man, what a great photo. Of, I just love three. that photo of me between two presidents, me Kennedy too. and Johnson. Uh, but, but they cropped it. They cropped it out. I and. Know. Uh, it's in the book, thankfully. Yeah, the three, thankfully, the we, three shot. yeah, we put the three shot inside the book. Well, I think one of the most fascinating things that I learned about you know the chronology of all of this, Dad, in reading the book, was going from 1960 here, where you're in this, to just one year later. Uh, that was the fellowship in New York. Oh correct? yeah, yeah. And then being sort of plucked out of just this slow oh. rise into this fast whirlwind. Grab oh. your seatbelt and go moment you, with LBJ. Well, you, you know, you're right. That literally, right after this picture was taken, uh, in the fall, uh, and they were getting ready to go out and campaign. This, this was a meeting at High Annis Sports where they were planning their campaign to get out and uh, go around the, the nation and uh, defeat uh, Richard Nixon, Henry, Henry Cabot Lodge. Uh, uh, and it was a, a, a tough campaign, believe me, as you all well know, who studied history. But the uh, the meeting, uh, shortly thereafter, I was accepted at CBS in New York for a CBS fellowship in news and public affairs. So I took a leave of absence from KTBC to go up there and to uh, study at Columbia in a graduate school of uh, uh, economics and government, and to spend time at CBS. Uh, it was a just combination work fellowship uh, and a wonderful thing. And by, and that was September, and, and while there, we got there and worked a, a bit at CBS on the uh, election night where uh, Kennedy and Johnson were elected. Uh, and then in May, I got a call from uh, Warren Woodward, uh, who was an aide for LBJ. And apparently what had happened, uh, <laughs> LBJ, bless his heart, this is, this is the way he operated. The night before, he had been the speaker at the Albert and Mary Lasker Foundation to honor uh, reporters for their work in health care. And, uh, and Mary Lasker was a close friend of Mrs. Johnson's, and they had uh, Pre uh, Vice President Johnson up and uh, to, uh, to give the keynote speech. And LBJ turned to Mary and says, Mary, I'm getting ready to go on a trip around the world, and all these f uh, reporters that you've recognized here for their good work on health, why don't you give them a little more money and let them come along on this trip and study the health conditions in these spots where I go around the world. Well, she did it. The next day, Fred Friendly, who was a senior producer at CBS and did a major, major television uh, work called Biography of a Cancer. Uh, at the time, it was unbelievable. It's still, still an unbelievable television study of cancer, how it grows, and what have you. Well, Fred was so dadgum busy and so high up at CBS, he said, I'm sorry, I can't take off for the next two weeks. So, White House, Warren would replace the call. He says, Neil, we've been talking about it up here. Fred can't go along. Uh, how would you like to go along on this trip around the world? I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, we leave tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, he said, do you have a passport? I said, I don't know. No, I don't have a passport. He said, you get down here, uh, or the way he phrased it, you get your butt down here right now to Washington from New York, 
We'll take you to the State Department, walk you through, and get your passport, get your shots while we're there, and then you'll be ready to get on the plane. I, 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 you know, I was, I was stammering. I had one suit and three ties to my name. <laughs> and a couple of shirts that were the dry cleaners uh, or somewhere? Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> a, a Chinese laundry. Chinese and so I go running out and, you know, pack up and get up and get down there, and we took off. Now, that, uh, you know, I still, I didn't even know where we were going. He <laughs> said, we're going around the world. Uh, and when I, when I got there, I got briefed, obviously. And we're going to go... Uh, President Kennedy is sending me to these key spots around the world to, to tell these leaders that we, you've got a new administration in Washington, and uh, we're, gonna, we're not going to change anything in our relationships with you, your country, but we want to reassure you that we're uh, going to work together as we have as allies, et cetera. And it was one of those uh, uh, glad-handing but fact-finding type trips. And you started in Vietnam? Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And in Vietnam, it was at that point, and I remember, it was 1960, they were, they were, they were killing people in Vietnam. It, it had not escalated to the full-scale war where it ultimately ended up after uh, Kennedy was assassinated and LBJ took over. And that's a whole other story. But we got to Vietnam and uh, to go see President Nodine Zim and his uh, sister, Madame Nu, they called her the Dragon Lady. They were running the country. And uh, we, uh, and it was a, one of those first trips where they, we had ad military advisors in Vietnam at that time, but they were just military, quote, advisors. We didn't have troops there. And uh, so we arrive, and they, uh, they planned this big welcome for the United States Vice President, and, uh, the, and I was in this group, Capitol Press Corps, uh, White House Press Corps, all of us, and they planned this reception for President and Mrs. Johnson, Vice President and Mrs. Johnson, and then they had a separate function for the uh, uh, Press Corps. Well, let me tell you something. I don't know how you all would react, but here I am, a young guy, and we're getting ready to go out, and, I, and I'm in a foreign country. I'd only been across the border in Mexico. <laughs> now, that was my foreign experience. Mm -hmm. And, I, and the, now, we get there, and so here, they said, we're treating the press corps, the Vietnamese did, to a dinner tonight at the uh, on a floating restaurant, uh, the Mekong restaurant on the Mekong River, uh, a f fancy little restaurant. Uh, I say fancy, you know, it wasn't elegant, but it was one of their better restaurants. And uh, so I, oh boy, okay, what time do we leave? And so I run down from the Caravelle Hotel where we were all staying, and they had a little van parked at the curb uh, to take us to press corps. But I, I looked around, I was the only one there. And uh, the rest of the press corps was doing exactly what the press corps does on these trips. They were upstairs drinking in a bar at the Caravelle <laughs> Hotel, and they didn't want to stop that at mm -hmm. that point. And they were telling stories to each other, as the press people always do. So I jumped in the van, sitting there waiting, okay, well, so they decided, well, we'll go ahead and take him, we'll come back and get the others. Okay, so we get to the restaurant, and we mm -hmm. walk in, and I walk in, and they were standing there waiting. Okay, I'm the first guy there. And uh, it turns out to be the only one from the press corps that showed up. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it, I, I, I said, okay, so he, hey, you want a beer? Sure, I'll take a beer. And uh, this guy sidled up beside me, and uh, he, when he talked to he sent in this picture, here I am uh, uh, sitting down. We'd sat down to have dinner, and he never, he never moved his lips. <laughs> he said, uh, Neil, I'm here. I'll help you. You do what I say, you'll be okay. I don't know if he was CIA or State <laughs> Department. I have no idea. He said, just do what I tell you. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> and, uh, okay. Well, while sitting there after having our first beer that, that, where that picture was taken, they bring out this big, fat, roasted pig. You know, like, like you see uh, pictures of a pig with an apple in his mouth. That, he didn't have the apple. 
But across the back, uh, his back of the pig, they had sliced the skin into s little squares uh, and uh, lathered it with a fantastically tasting uh, sauce of some kind. But it was like pork rinds. That's, that's all it was. It just uh, we, we called it crackling and pork rinds. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting there, and I said, oh, hey, this is pretty neat, you know. Put it in front of me. And the guy next to me said, Neil, do what I tell you. <laughs> Okay, and then uh, he said, see the little the tail, the little curly Q tail on the pig? Uh-huh, pick it up. Hmm? <laughs> Grab the pig's tail and pick it up. I, I picked it up, and I said, uh, okay. He said, now eat it. <laughs> eat it, go ahead, eat it. So I did, I, you know, it tasted like crackling. There wasn't anything unusual. <laughs> But here I am eating a pig's butt, and I don't. And they cheered. I oh, they, they all oh, applauded. Yeah, great. They? <laughs> I don't know if they figured this dumb American would do anything, <laughs> or, or if it was some sort of ritual. I have no idea. He said, he, he said, don't worry about it. I'll tell you about it later. Go ahead, enjoy yourself. He never told me. I have no idea what it was about. And you don't even know who he was, do you? Still no. to this day. No, I didn't even know his name. Uh -uh. <laughs> uh, but he never left my side mm -hmm. uh, while we were there. Well, and then from there, you had other opportunities with LBJ, and LBJ turns out to be fairly spontaneous when he wanted oh. to stop, right? And oh. you guys jumped out in a place that was unsecure, and uh, you weren't certain what was happening, and his press corps yelled, jump out along the, the trail. It's still in Vietnam, and... Um, and he's going into a village, is that correct? Yeah, in fact, uh, the, the picture shows, I, I, by the way, I carried a camera with me, not a movie camera, just a little Argus C3 camera, 35 millimeter slides. And all these pictures were, you know, that I took were these 35 millimeter Kodachrome slides. Uh, and you know, you take one picture and you, uh, you don't take any more. It's not like digital where you chick, 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 take everything you need. So we, we stop and he, we're out in the motorcade, and he stops at this village, and in effect says, I want to go talk to these people. His point was, you need to get out, the Vietnamese leaders, you need to get out and visit with the people. And that's what he did as a campaigning in Texas and all. So he goes out, and the press and the security got, oh my goodness, we have not checked out this village. The Viet Cong, the guerrillas who were fighting the Vietnamese government, hid themselves, in, came out of villages at, at night and do their damage, et cetera, and then they'd go back. But they, they were everywhere. Uh, that, that was that guerrilla-type warfare. And they were concerned. The vice president's going to get killed. So it, it's going to be an international incident. We don't know what's going to happen. So we go running to catch up, pile out of the press bus, running to catch up to him and uh, see him. And he's doing his Texas campaign, shaking hands. How you doing? I'm Vice President Johnson. I'm from the United States of America. Glad to be here. You know, what, it was just a typical campaign event, but only in, in a war-torn country. So right in front of me is the press. We were madly dashing when I took that picture uh, just uh, to show him going in, and I knew he was getting ready to go into the village. You see him in the white shirt that I took there. And I took that picture, and the, but the guy in front of me that was running along, his sport coat was smoking. It was on fire. In one of the pockets. I, uh, I yeah. thought, my goodness, what's happening here? You, know, I, you, you know, think of the chaos. Whoa, what's going on? So I grabbed, being the hero that I was, I grabbed <laughs> his sport coat, pulled it off his back, threw it down on the ground, and the smoke was coming from his, the area of his side pocket. And I stomped on it and, and to put out the, the fire. And I, then I left and ran on to catch up with LBJ. Well, nothing happened. Everything turned out fine in that village. It was just one of those that could be a problem, didn't be, turn out to be a problem. So we're sitting in the Caravel Bar <laughs> that evening, at, back there, all of us, and uh, I look over across the way and I see Peter Kalisher, who was the Far East correspondent for CBS News. And I said, oh, I, I go over and I say, Pete, I'm Neil Spelt, 
I'm a CBS uh, fellow in New, uh, in New York, and we're here as part of the press corps. Uh, anything you need, you can call on me. I'll be glad to help you. And I, I said, well, did, did you, did, were you out there when the LBJ went to the village today? He said, oh, yeah. Some crazy son of a bitch tore my coat off my back and <laughs> stomped on the pipe I had put in my pocket and crushed my favorite pipe. <laughs> Oh shit! Who did you? <laughs> did you see who did that? <laughs> he said, "No, I didn't see him." I said, "Well, Pete, sure good to see you. Now you let me know." And I went back to nurse. But LBJ generated so many events like that, and in in that bit in Vietnam, it was such an important part of what he did. We later found out in doing the research for the book that he wrote a report back to Kennedy saying, we've got to get the Vietnamese leadership out and get them meeting and greeting and working with the people because they're isolated, and that's why the guerrillas are getting out there and taking over and doing so much damage. Well, he was practicing that very memo that he wrote. That we didn't, I didn't find out about it until you know, 30, 40 years later when we were doing the research here for this. But that was LBJ. That, uh, that was the way he operated and, and what he did. Uh, also on that. And I was going to say, while he's so very focused and he is working to try to bring people together, he also had that sense of humor that <laughs> <laughs> you, you got to witness at the Taj Mahal no. uh, on that same trip. On that same trip. We, we went to India. Uh, you, go, you go to India and con con Prime Minister Nehru called on. Uh, I've got some great pictures of Nehru and Johnson together. A little short guy, big tall guy. Uh, but uh, one of the things you do when you go to uh, India as a tourist, mm -hmm. uh, you go visit the Taj Mahal in Agra, India. I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful building. Magnificent structure built by a former leader of India who uh, dedicated it to his dead wife. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a uh, structure. Uh, white, ivory-type structure, just beautiful. And it's, a, it's pretty much a shrine. And, and you know, you walk in, you take your shoes off, and, and it's, you're very reverential when you walk into the facility. And amazing architecture, amazing building. And LBJ looks around. I wonder what the acoustics are like here. <laughs> and, then, and then he goes, Yee-ha! <laughs> and probably 17 times louder than that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, uh, uh, you know, that was the story the, the press corps picked up on. LBJ lets you use a Texas yell and inside the Taj Mahal. He, <laughs> you made fun of him. Uh, but after it's over, they gave him the replica that you see here in the picture of the uh, Taj Mahal, two of them. One of them is at the LBJ library now, uh, still there. And again, it, this was one of those moments where the, the loyalty and the relationships kind of popped up. Uh, we're all standing around there as he's, as he's given the deal. And he looks up and he says, Neil, you want to get a picture up here with me? So, well, yeah. <laughs> and I walk up there and, you know, we get this wonderful picture. And, and right after they took this picture, uh, Mrs. Johnson came up and the three of us and stood there and posed for a photo. So uh, the, the relationship was building uh, between this kid, remember, uh, who was an employee. I thought I was, was a very underpaid employee uh, <laughs> at the TV station. And uh, it, it, it just, it just kind of kept growing uh, all along the way. Mm -hmm. And then, bringing it back to stateside. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a portion in the book where you really talk about the White House on the Pergnalis. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, I know we're at 720, so I do want to make sure we're able to oh, tell a few more stories. But I, I do think that it's, it's certainly something that we're all so familiar with here in Central Texas and uh, would love just to tell us a little bit about what it was like for you all and for you and the experiences you had uh, reporting and assisting with events and things out at the well, uh, ranch? Well, LBJ has a, had a tremendous flair uh, and, and for the visual 
for the, you know, just to tell a story. He, he turned a lot of things into uh, 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 events that were important. And remember, LBJ uh, continued that. Now, this was while vice president. He had Walter Jaton, it was called the Barbecue King, uh, out of Fort Worth. And he was uh, LBJ's favorite caterer uh, for barbecue at the ranch. And he would come down, and they'd, they'd set it up and do a wonderful barbecue spread for dignitaries and guests. Uh, and, you know, w with a flair, you know, everybody, they give everybody a red bandana to put around their neck while they're there. They'd also uh, had a, a big pit where they roasted a side of beef. Uh, it was for show. They didn't cut into that beef. It was just there to create an <laughs> atmosphere. Uh, they had a covered chuck wagon. <laughs> and on the side, it said, all the way with LBJ. It, it just uh, was one of those events uh, made for a good time sort of thing. Well, a, a lot of things happened during all that time. Uh, as it turns out, uh, Hubert Humphrey, when uh, LBJ was nominated for president uh, for uh, running uh, for re-election, he selected Hubert Humphrey as his vice president. Now remember, when LBJ was president to begin with, right after the assassination, there was no vice president at that point. Mm -hmm. So we were sitting there. That they changed the law later to do that line of succession like we're talking about. So it was really important that when LBJ was nominated at the convention in Atlantic City that uh, he selected, uh, who he selected, uh, was vice president. And that was to be set up uh, something that we hadn't, we hadn't had a vice president for a couple of years. And Hubert Humphrey was, uh, he, he spelled loyal, he was a loyal LBJ man, but Hubert Humphrey and he was, they called him the happy warrior. And he, he, he was ebullient, he would laugh, he would have a good time. Uh, he, uh, I don't know why I just thought of this. He didn't use aftershave, he used powder on his face. Did he really? Yeah, now what that had to do with anything, I don't know, but it just popped into my head. <laughs> but, uh, could you tell there was powder on his face? Well, you, you could right after he came, uh, you know, at the starting of the day, <laughs> but he would use powder. Now, I, I understand gentlemen did that back then. Mm. I don't know, but uh, he... Uh, well, uh, and you did on television. I use makeup, <laughs> and now that I, now that I'm no longer on television, I only use makeup when I want to. <laughs> anyway, uh, Hubert Humphrey uh, was invited to the ranch first out of rattled out of the bag right after they got the nomination. It was a big deal, a big press, everybody out there. LBJ put him in LBJ's clothes. And not same size, but the <laughs> khaki, LBJ wore the khaki jacket and khaki pants and his uh, Stetson and got it all for Hubert Humphrey and put him on a horse. Now, I don't know if Hubert Humphrey had ever ridden a horse ever, but he was so out, I mean, he was so out of his element, uh, but he, gamely, that's yes, Mr. President, whatever you want sort of thing. And uh, and he would, he looked like, if you remember more recently, when Michael Dukakis was running for president and they put him in a tank, a turret of a tank, and had the picture look so out of place in the turret of a tank. Hubert Humphrey was the same way. And he did ride the horse. They did ride. Uh, LBJ took off, kind of off out toward the pasture and, and Humphrey right behind him, just barely, you know, barely able to get there. But the events at the ranch in Central Texas were so important. Uh, world leaders, and, and let me tell you, LBJ really, really sold or made uh, the Central Texas area uh, an important part. It wasn't just going to the ranch. Now, that was a big deal for a world leader, for anybody to be invited to the, the ranch. But LBJ, as an example, had two different uh, chancellors of West Germany uh, invited to come in. 
and I've got a picture of Ludwig Erhard. I didn't put it in the book, but where I don't think I did, where uh, eating, uh, the aide is wiping the barbecue off uh, Chancellor Ludwig Erhard's coat. Where he spilled it while you know eating uh, eating barbecue. But he would you know he would go to Fredericksburg, and he had Van Cliburn as entertainment at the ranch. Well, not at the ranch, but out at this. Uh, uh, what's that classic octagon building uh, in Fredericksburg? The uh, pavilion? Yeah, it's kind of a it's pavilion, kind of a pavilion, but uh, and uh, they took the uh, the chancellor there, and sitting inside at the piano was the young man from Fort Worth who had just won Moscow's uh, Tchaikovsky piano uh, competition, playing Tchaikovsky's. Uh, uh, number one, symphony number one, and he was sitting there, very distinguished young guy, wearing tie and tails, and sitting on a hay bale <laughs> instead of a bench. I mean, it was such a great picture, but there he was. He, you know, he would say, this country, this part of Texas was founded by Germans and people of Germanic heritage, and we relish that, we enjoy it. Fredericksburg, and he mentioned, I remember him saying something about, he couldn't pronounce it right, but he mentioned New Braunfels was named for Count Solms von Braunfels, you know, <laughs> so, so, he, so he used uh, uh, everything. It, was just, it wasn't just, hey, let's have a party out at the ranch. Let's invite some people. It, it turned out to be messaging that, that he really liked to do and carry forward. And uh, he, had, he had everybody there. It, uh, Republicans and Democrats, uh, they didn't, uh, they, it wasn't one of those partisan uh, deals. If, uh, I've got a picture of John Connolly out there. Well, John Connolly was his campaign manager uh, and governor of Texas at the time, who later uh, changed to uh, uh, the Republican Party. <laughs> Liz Carpenter, <laughs> I mentioned this earlier, when John Connolly, uh, a, a governor of Texas as a Democrat, switched to a Republican, Liz, boy, now you talk about a highly partisan person. I mean, she, she came dressed, we had a Halloween party one time at, at our house, and uh, Mrs. Johnson came dressed in a witch's outfit mm -hmm. and a pointed hat and all, and Liz showed up as a yellow dog Democrat. <laughs> and she had a dog nose mask <laughs> on and a yellow flourish, you know, yes. chiffon, dress. And she said, I'm a yellow dog Democrat. So that's Liz. <laughs> so you've been around all of these incredibly well-known personalities, but uh, Daryl Royal humbled you at oh. one point. Uh, with Willie Nelson, you're driving out on uh, the ranch. With oh, yeah. Let me tell you. Mac, Cook. you'll get a kick out of this. <laughs> uh, Wally Pryor, who was, uh, this is Mac Royal out here, by the way. I don't know if you met him, who was uh, whose mom and daddy were Daryl and Edith Royal, and that's Daryl and Edith back in their younger days. Picture I took of them. I'm proud of that. They look, you know, handsome, mm -hmm. vigorous couple. Nice lighting. Yeah. Good job, Dad. And uh, the uh, Daryl uh, was as down home a person as you can remember. Oklahoma, born and bred, just very, very genuine as a, as a real person. Uh, and one afternoon, Wally Pryor, who was uh, a director at the TV station, called up and said, Neil, Geech Cook and I are going to take Daryl and Willie Nelson uh, uh, out on a drive around a piece of land out in the hill country that they're thinking about buying to turn into a, a kind of a Texas resort type location. And uh, do you want to come along while we go, just go look at that dirt? I said, oh, yeah, sure. I'll bring the beer. So I bought a case of cheap <laughs> Mexican beer. And uh, we went out and driving around, and it was uh, pretty much at, uh, well, in the area, it, it was kind of nondescript. It wasn't near anything, but uh, it was uh, 290 was the road. Uh, and uh, we're in the pickup truck uh, with uh, Wally driving the pickup truck, Floyd Tillman, uh, was uh, there, uh, the great uh, uh, country music star uh, who was sitting in the front seat with Wally. And uh, as we were kind of going around the ranch, and Daryl and Willie and I 
were in a pickup truck in the back end, standing up, as you're not supposed to do, but we were out in the country, <laughs> and with our hands, you know, holding on to the roof of the pickup truck. Wally, slow down a little bit. It's kind of bumpy, you know, that sort of stuff. <laughs> well, anyway, Wally leaned his head out and says, I'm going to go out on the highway. We need to go around and look at the other side of the ranch. Okay. So we get out, and he hits that bumps and goes out on the highway and starts speeding. Okay. <laughs> Daryl Willie and I are just hanging out. I say, Wally, <laughs> slow down, <laughs> slow down. <laughs> Daryl, Daryl looked at me, Mike, and says, you know, Neil, if we have a wreck and they're all killed, ain't nobody going to know you died. <laughs> 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 Daryl Willie and somebody else were killed. <laughs> <laughs> he, he really, uh, there's so many great, and Willie Nelson, uh, just, uh, fr frankly, uh, well, I can't, we're, we're kind of running long. Let's, uh, I know we you want to answer here. questions. Yeah, let's yeah, do that. We have time still for Q&A, correct, Wayne? Yeah. Okay, terrific. So, yeah, and anything that you all want, you can just holler right out. And Any questions about anything? When, if you don't mind me asking, when was the last time you saw him? Uh, President Johnson. Uh, the last time I saw him was when he made his last public words. Uh, in fact, in the audio book, I've got his first words that he spoke when he was elected, uh, when he became president, uh, when the plane landed Andrews Air Force Base at that time in Washington, carrying Kennedy's body and uh, Mrs. Kennedy, and he read Liz Carpenter's three by five card where she wrote some comments and, and he penciled down a few of his remarks, spoke to the nation. Last time I spoke to him was when we st staged uh, at the LBJ library, it was open, and uh, he wanted to have a symposium that was part of the library functions. And we had a civil rights symposium and had every major civil rights leader in the country at a thousand seat auditorium was filled. It was a very tense time, very tense. Uh, emotions were raw and, uh, and all the, not just major civil rights leaders, but just anybody who was active, uh, they showed up. And LBJ was r under a doctor's care at that time. And uh, he was advised by his military doctor, who was right there. And I was, I was there kind of back in the green room, helping as a volunteer at that time, loyal volunteer, helping out with the crowd and, and uh, helping uh, the speakers get ready to go out and speak. And uh, as we, uh, uh, back there, <laughs> well, back in that, <laughs> It's not the exact last time, but it's the almost. It was the same day, same moment. I'm back there, and Mike Howard came out to me and said, "Neil, the man needs to talk to you." I said, "Okay, sure. Where where is he? I don't see him. Come with me." Well, he opened the door to the men's room, and said, "He's in there," <laughs> and he was in there sitting on the pot. <laughs> and Mike says, "I'm not going in. You go on in." <laughs> And uh, he, you know, had something not really consequential, but just something he, I, you know, I just thought about this, let's do that so, sort of thing. The military doctor was standing there. Now, this was in January, and he was, uh, had a top coat, but it was kind of a raincoat top coat. It was cold. And the military doctor just was hovering all around him and told him, LBJ not to go out and speak because he was having heart problems. LBJ says, I've got to go talk to him. So he went out at the end of the symposium uh, and spoke. He was challenged from the crowd. A, a young man stood up and yelled at him, yelled at him, and started w walking toward the podium. Uh, if you've been in the LBJ auditorium, you know it's all wide open. And uh, they moved to stop him, and he said, no, let him talk. He's, he's got something to say. He said, and so the young man spoke, said something, 
it was, a, it was accusatory. It wasn't, uh, you know, hey, you're a great guy, LBJ. It was, look, you, we've been oppressed, you know, and just, it was, it was his, a speech that he was making. And LBJ stood there and listened. Took a nitroglycerin tablet and put it under his tongue because he was having heart palpitations at that time. I saw it. We got it on film. And, uh, and he was fragile. And standing behind him, uh, behind LBJ at the podium, off in the wings, but where I could see him, that doctor was standing there leaning, watching LBJ, e every, every movement. And LBJ was, if you, if you could get a chance to look at that entire speech, he started out very, you know, very calm and weak. He grew stronger mm -hmm. as he was speaking. And I can't remember the words exactly. I've got them in the audio book. Uh, but he said something right at the very end. And it was, uh, it was all directed towards civil rights. You know, if we have the courage, if we have the strength, if we have the will, something along those lines, and we work together, and we tr uh, uh, conquer diversity or something along those lines, we shall overcome. Mm -hmm. Boom. He died next month. Mm -hmm. Those were his last words. Mm -hmm. You know, he, uh, he was a passionate man. He really was deeply passionate about what he believed. I remember when he was talking about C uh, civil rights. Now remember, he started out teaching school in Catula, Texas to uh, all Hispanic Latin American kids. That's when, I mean, young kids. I remember him t saying one time, I forget her name now, the, the uh, cook at the LBJ Ranch. I, I mentioned her in the book. I forget her name right now. But he said that uh, uh, how did he phrase it? He put it uh, that Whenever so so and so m m came to visit me in Washington, we had her here in Washington, and then when she went back home to the ranch, she couldn't find a restroom that would let her in. Mm. <laughs> now, let me say one final thing. I love the guy. As, as, as much, as many flaws as he had, and uh, forget his politics in that sense, but here was a guy who passionately believed in something, and he worked his heart out figuratively to make it happen, mm -hmm. and he took advantage of every opportunity that presented himself along the way. You watch that CNN documentary, those four parts over, over two nights, and you can see the depth of his concern. Vietnam, my gosh, he agonized. I didn't, I wasn't there in the White House. I was not with him in the White House, but uh, in looking at those film and, uh, and watching, you could see the depth of his concern. He had two son-in-laws in Vietnam, uh, Pat Nugent and uh, Chuck Robb. Uh, Pat married Lucy and Chuck married Linda. And uh, he, he was someone who, he wore his feelings right here. Mm -hmm. You could see, you knew what he was and, and how he, uh, people hated him. Now let me tell you, he knew that people hated him. And yet he persevered. Mm -hmm. Now that, uh, that tells me, look at today, there's so much hate going around out there. Look at that. that, that that's not new. LBJ was the, the target of so much hate, so much hate, uh, from a lot of people who uh, believed like he did, but didn't really care for the way he did it, or didn't even, yeah, he wasn't Harvard educated. He wasn't... Uh, uh, John F. Kennedy, they, they compared him to John Kennedy. 
There was no comparison. Two different worlds, two different people, two different personalities. But LBJ knew that they didn't like him. They knew that Bobby Kennedy, he, he knew Bobby Kennedy was out to undercut him all the way through. But here's a guy who had the persistence and the perseverance to go ahead and proceed because I firmly believe of his passionate belief in what, what he was doing and never ending energy level to, to make it happen. So to answer your question, I'm sorry I got off on that, but to answer your question, that was the last time I saw LBJ uh, was there and, and he got through, he took more than one nitroglycerin tablet uh, during that time. And uh, literally a, a month later he was dead mm -hmm. at the ranch uh, in the afternoon. And then uh, I was asked to help on the funeral. Obviously, we did a lot of things there. We're in charge of the funeral mm -hmm. burial out at the ranch. Uh, others handled the other aspect of LBJ's uh, last few days after he died. And was also the uh, person who uh, was the spokes spokesman for the uh, Mrs. Johnson's uh, death when she died mm -hmm. and, uh, and all of her services. So I've seen the family and seen how he reacted uh, with his family. And I can tell you this, that uh, this museum uh, is, is a wonderful tribute to a guy. But don't you ever let the criticism that you hear about LBJ, oh, he made mistakes. Haven't we all? <laughs> oh, he made mistakes. Oh, he, uh, and he admits the mistakes. You know, it's all here in the LBJ with the bark off. And he says the triumphs and the sorrows. But don't you ever let anybody uh, uh, tell you that this was not a good man in the best definition of the word, because he was. Uh, he was a good man who believed fervently uh, in uh, his core values and what he felt was most important. And he persevered through so much. And some of it had to be with part of his upbringing here in the heart of Texas. Mm -hmm. I think he, uh, he kind of showed that. Now, I'll close with one final word, uh, because I got off on too big a tangent there. When I mentioned the, the, your museum here, be sure and uh, continue your good work here. Uh, in the museum, because LBJ is going to be recognized more and more as the years go by as someone who uh, uh, was a very, very consequential president, very consequential, uh, with all that he accomplished and, and uh, through his failures, uh, what he went through, uh, uh, and his impact on this country uh, is more recently now being recognized after they get past the uh, uh, the immediacy of his presidency and you look back at what happened and how it happened and his role and uh, what was going on at the time and how he m just moved right through all of that and his final decision not to seek a second term, second full term when he announced it on television, was, I think, one of the most honest speeches I've ever heard. He said he did not want anything to get in the way of trying to bring peace to Vietnam. And I, therefore, am not going to run for re-election. I'm going to devote my entire time to that. So think about the guy. Think about the man. Uh, and that's how I... I've kind of viewed most of the people I write about in the book uh, as people, personalities. And they're all so different, but they all are someone that you need to look beyond the public image and look at the, uh, the man himself. And uh, as I said, the little seen side of LBJ, seldom seen side, uh, shows a lot about who the guy is and what he what he's done. Mm -hmm. I thank you for the opportunity to be mm -hmm. here. You do good work with this museum. Yes, you, you need to keep it up and to continue it and to expand it. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. Thank you all.